Well, those are, those are good sized boxes, almost as big as the freaking seat boxes. Just a little bit narrower, they fit through the front door better. <laughs> and inside we've got very nice protection, close to home cell, power cord, manual, and the sub itself. So flipping it upside down here, we do have isolation feet. They're not hard plastic like most other subs. So all set there. And then the sub itself. So the finish is definitely not like a veneer. I would prefer a veneer or real wood, but this is fine. It's a satin black. You can see it doesn't have too much gloss or sheen. Not a fan of that. My main speakers have the same satin finish, but without the texture. So it'll blend in fine. And I love the grills. These are really sturdy. These aren't just open fabric like this which as they get dusty will show and you have to clean them. This is thick, twice as thick material. And then popping it off here, we'll see one of the drivers. Now I'm gonna leave these grills on, I like the look. I ran my SVS off because I wasn't a fan of the barbecue grate look. Oh man, that's huge. <laughs> All right, so there you go. Now I just have to get them in place. I'll use furniture sliders and retune the whole room. And we got another driver also active on the other side. So I had a little bit of a snafu here. I was moving my left main here and almost tipped it over. Usually you just pivot it, got the four adjustment feet on the spikes, but look at that. Two out of the three mounting screws have completely backed out from vibration <laughs> and they are sitting on the floor so it's literally teetering on these two back posts and only held in place by the front so I'm waiting for a helper because they're over 100 pounds a piece and if I try to tip it over I know it would probably snap one of those screws or mess up the mount so I need somebody to hold the base and then I'll lay it down and screw them back into place right one's okay so after that's done, this guy here can slide into position. And I'd almost forgotten to blank out all my EQs and mini DSP settings and everything to restart calibration. That's the first step. Oh yeah, I would love your guys' feedback from those of you that have really nice racks. So this is just a piece I made with IKEA parts. Smoke glass door, uh, everything fits in there, but it's really crammed. It's one of those things where don't look behind it and it looks great, you know, but I, I have no room and my next upgrade will be to an HTP one processor and I'll probably swap out this three channel amp for the nine, but I want some more room, you know, and this one just, it's at its limit. And of course you get the rat's nest behind it. I mean, everything works. And when the sub is there, you can't see anything, but I know it's there. I just want something else, something more professional, something where I can cable manage, you know, something better. But it has to look like this. I want it completely living room friendly. I love the smoked glass look. I don't like to see equipment. I don't like to see lights. I have everything turned off, except a uh, little diagnostics. I gotta get a switch in there and I need to see what things are doing. And that's it. So I don't want anything open. And yes, I do have a big, silent cooling fan in the back so when it's on everything stays nice and cool never had anything even get warm in there but i haven't found anything that fits the bill everything is just a you know an industrial computer type or behind the scenes type rack i'm not gonna actually rack mount anything i want something with shelves but i love the smoke glass look and unfortunately ikea doesn't have anything like this bigger it's just little modules and things like that. And this is not sturdy at all. This is like the worst kind of furniture where that flimsy board on the back is actually structural. So the whole thing can wobble, <laughs> not that great. So if anyone has suggestions with this kind of look, but bigger and much better quality, I'm all ears. Uh Oh, it's puppy play time. Uh, tech dogs got the subs 
in position. Subs are where they're going to need to be. You, know, you can move them a, a few inches here and there. It doesn't make that big of a difference. I already know these spots are good for subs in this room. Tested many subs in this room and had them in those spots. Speakers are just roughed in. I've just got them in a base configuration right now. This one should be, uh, I'm going to say 75% set. The front and back does not change for this speaker. This is called the anchor speaker, and it's coupling to the wall and the pressure in the room. And that's already set. What's going to change is at the very end, just setting the final toe in. And that's just done, you know, a degree or two at a time. Does make a difference. There are a few tracks that I use to really dial it in. Super easy. Uh, the best one to use, well, uh, two. If you're looking for the best image in your speakers, number one, Nora Jones' Little Room. Play this one last, though. It should just sound like she's in your freaking living room. It should sound like a human head floating in the dead center of your stereo image, and it should just feel real. But to set a real easy angle up, uh, the Beatles... Oh, crap. What's the... T uh, uh, she's a Nice Girl, I think it's called. Anyway, it's, it's like a 10-second track, if that. And it just pans their voices from right to left smoothly. And what you're listening for is zero change in that image. It should sound just like somebody walking across the front of your room. I got a lot of testing to do. There's, again, a couple test tracks. And it's simply moving it forward. I got to lay down a track of tape to make measurement marks and move it first an inch at a time to find some good nodal points. And then in between those, a millimeter at a time until it just locks and all of a sudden the speakers will completely disappear when you're sitting in the one seat and then you can do your toe in i've already got them angled properly that won't change i already dialed that in that basically sets your stage height and i have it set for a human singer normal height so when there's somebody singing in the center their head's right about here which is about six feet off the ground and then I can go ahead and do the REW and do the re-EQs for the subs and then do the room correction through the AVR. Yay, fun, fun. Okay, so after a delay, wife was enjoying the setup here and it's not even tuned. Let's go ahead and continue on. So really astoundingly happy with the two channel stereo setup. Can't believe how much better it sounds just by centering everything and having a proper listening position. Okay, onto the subs. So the first thing I'm doing is level matching, making sure that at the listening position, the gain matches, so both are producing the same amount of sound, not the same quality of sound, but the same amount of sound. Now, interestingly, I've got a buzz coming out of this one. If I set the crossover to disabled, which you usually do on a sub. You let the EVR or the mini DSP or whatever you're using handle crossover duty. But I have to just, just eke it on. It's set to about 140 right now, which is fine because it's well above my crossover point and it kills the buzz. So just something to note there. The room size down there is a uh, extreme low end boost, which I have all the way up because I need that because I have no reinforcement. If these were going in a corner, you wouldn't need that. So I've got this one as a baseline. And up, oh, we can't see it. I just switched over, turned on the other sub. I'm going to go ahead and measure that. Oh, and I forgot to turn the crossover up on that because I heard a little bit of the buzz going. So now, don't need you any more meter. Don't need you any more generator. Now we can see this is with both gain knobs at 12 o'clock, just straight up halfway in its range. And what we want to do is just take an average. I mean, there's going to be obviously parts that are above, parts that are below, but you want to look at where they're really lining up and then look at the actual volume differences. So I would say just looking at this, that the right is just slightly lower in level. Now before, I'm trying to remember, I had a 2 dB difference with the old subs, and the right one was turned up. So it's the room. It's affecting any sub you put there in the same way. You know, the, the rest of the house is just absorbing the bass more than this is being reinforced by the room. So I will turn that knob up. I don't know 
what the knob position correlates to as far as dBs, but I know I probably need about a 2B, 2 dB bump, and that kind of correlates to what this chart says. So I'm gonna just trial and error it until I get these lines a little closer. So I turned the gain up on the right one to about the 12 and a half position, not quite to one o'clock, and that looks really good. We've got nice correlation here on this, right down here at the extreme low end, obviously crisscrossing in the middle, but overall, I think that is pretty well gain matched. Now, we're gonna do the phase or delay. I'm going to adjust that one because I know that previously and on my other subs, this side needs a delay. However, that was at the last seating position. It was offset. I was a lot closer to that sub. So I'm gonna have to trial and error it. I may not need any adjustment here since I'm exactly centered. I think I'll need a little something just because the room is playing tricks with it the same way it does with the reinforcement and the gain. But uh, I'm just gonna trial and error again, and I'm gonna test with both subs on now, and we're just going to eke that delay knob little by little, test, little, test, little, and look at all the different charts and see which one looks the best. Just takes time. Here's the first result. This is just out of the box, no delay adjustment to either. And you can see that we've got a big old nasty null right there around 110 and a little bit right there about 56. So we'll see if that improves. That's what we're looking to improve. And if we get summation and build up elsewhere along the way, even better. Okay, and that was quick. So this is our baseline. This is with both at zero. And I tested just going up in large jumps to see where we were at. One didn't do anything. Three looked darn good, smoothed out a great deal. But you're not looking for perfect at this point. You're looking at, is it good enough to EQ? And are there any nulls? And are there any peaks? And that's really not that big of a deal. So that's our best one so far. Turn our baseline off. I shot past it and things started getting worse. We can see a null developing here, about 46. Just to confirm, six was even worse. So we don't like those. Then I went back and tested around three. Four was a little bit worse. Six was a little bit worse in the upper base. And uh, two also was uh, a little weak. So we're sticking with three. So that is going to be our delay, three milliseconds. And yes, I could absolutely do the same thing in the mini DSP if I wanna do it that way, do it on the input. Um, let's see, no, I'd have to do it on the output to the right sub. That's the gain, that's the delay. So I could just program that in there uh, it's six of one, half a dozen of the other. It makes absolutely no difference which way you do it, here or on the physical sub. So pre-EQ, this is what we're looking at for these two subs in this room. You can see I've got my scale down to two. That's the lowest REW will go. This is 10, so it's nice and powerful all the way to 10. And then we start dropping off you know, somewhere around here. My crossover is usually 80 or 90 when I'm done with the system. So that's fine. And then a nice roll off to whatever it's cut off at somewhere around here in the actual sub knob. So we have plenty of nice strong base to work with now to EQ. In the middle of setting my house curve here, I looked at that and I just realized I still had my freaking crossover in the AVR set to 80. So we're gonna bump that up to 200, take that out of the equation. We'll do another test here real quick. There we go, that looks better. I thought that was missing a lot of upper base. <laughs> so the blue line is truly the subs output. Okay, back to work. And by the way, just the subs are on during this part. The towers are physically unplugged. All right, so the first pass isn't too bad. It evened out pretty much all those big peaks there. You can see what it came from. I'd like a little bit more in the extreme low end. I really thought I would be getting down you know, into the single digits solidly, but there's a good five dB difference here between you know, 15 and 10. That's pretty much what I had before with the SB16s. And this slope is built in, so I'll keep playing. 
Okay, so here's my final result after a ton of testing. I'll tell you, getting rid of that null was not easy, and it took a combination of moving the actual subs as much as possible and a lot of EQ and filtering trial and error in REW, and it's not totally automatic. There are a ton of variables that you have to adjust to actually get it to where you want it, and the predicted line is not always accurate, so it's just knowing what to reach and what each variable is going to do. Fortunately, I've done enough. So you can see I programmed in a nice solid 10 dB house curve, assuming I'm gonna cross over at 80, which I may or may not. I was running 90 with the SVS, just because I was getting some weird phase cancellation. My mains are actually four ways, and one of the crossovers is at 80 and another at 100, because there's built-in subwoofers to the towers. They are phenomenal speakers on their own. But really kind of messes you up when you try to tie in subs. So 90 fit a lot better the last time. But we're in a different position this time and I'm getting a lot better response out of that one. So that may change. But either way, at least a 10 dB. If I cross over at 90, it's more like a 15. So pretty happy about that. And look at that extension all the way down to 10 nice and flat all the way through the 20s, and then just starts to drop off, looks about eight, nine, somewhere in there. So that is definitely reaching almost 10 hertz solid lower than I was getting before. So that's a win. Oh, and just for giggles and confirmation, I did try going from large to small on the room, which is a low end curve built into the sub. The green is small, so that's made for rooms where you're able to put the subs in a corner and you know they're in a small enclosed space, so you've got a lot of reinforcement and you don't need that artificial boost. I need all I can get. So <laughs> this, was, this was before final tweaking, but at this point is when I did the comparison. And you can see that it's, uh, let's see, about a 10 dB boost, evenly spread. And this was with no other changes, just one run changing the knob and another run. So it's nice and subtle, and it's just a total tilt in the sub response. And now finally bringing the mains online and playing with crossovers. This is at 90, and this was again my best result. And it's just because of the physical crossovers in the speakers and how they react to crossing them over in the AVR. Let's see, you can see the difference here. With it crossover at 80, again, this huge peak, this huge null, I should say, right here. And that's just because of the crossover. But once you bump it up to 90, you are good to go. So that's nice and smooth, really healthy. I got plenty of room here. If it's too much, it's easy just to dial the volume down. Super simple. So I just finished a half an hour of low level, negative 35 listening after finishing all the setup. I have to do final testing tomorrow at full volume and actually set the levels. I know I'm going to have to drop it because it is just ridiculously good at low volumes, but the house is asleep, so I can't do anything more tonight. Yeah, tomorrow's going to be fun. Oh, and one other thing. I'm going to use the old black tape trick because I've got this obnoxious green light and it's pretty freaking bright when the lights are off. <laughs> now, normally you wouldn't see that because these are actually designed to shoot sideways. And that's supposed to be on the back, but my room doesn't accommodate that. I could do it here, but not over there. and They just wouldn't look good. Flip one, not the other. So the amps are facing the inside on my configuration. But I don't know if I can even see this one from the seats. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, I'll cover that one too. So... We're here the next day. <laughs> I couldn't sleep much at all. As soon as the wife got up, took the dogs for a walk, I've been out here maxing everything out, getting the final levels tweaked, did have to turn it down a little bit simply to taste because it was just too much. So I've got good and bad news. Good news is everything is tuned in perfectly. Everything is working perfectly. No problems with the subs. The integration went great. No complaints whatsoever. Bad news is, there is so much bass now and at such levels that I am at, actually past, the limitations of 
my room. I mean the physical construction of my room. The biggest problem I have right now are new things vibrating. And I mean, that's not a good thing. It's not, ha ha, oh, that's so cool. No, that's, that's really annoying. <laughs> I got this back wall here, which has always been a problem because it's very thin and hollow. It separates bedrooms and everything from this room. And I had it pretty locked down before, but a couple new little rattles have started. The big problem is this wall right here, which is the side of the fireplace that we never freaking use. And I have no idea why they still build in Florida, but they do. And the whole damn thing is resonating. I mean, I don't mean it's moving and you hear creaking and rattling. I mean, it's resonating. with every freaking bass hit. And of course it's delayed, so it just starts to sound muddy. I'm gonna have to work on it, but there's not a whole lot I can do. Maybe I'll turn down slightly, you know, at the extreme low end, I'm not sure. But uh, it's, it's in close proximity to the sub here. And with the driver now firing into this corner, it's just too much for it. That's all there is to it. I might experiment with moving the sub over and you know maybe putting it on this side of the speaker i don't know i don't think it'll make much of a difference just in that little bit of proximity there but i'm not kidding the it's exciting the room i mean that from a sound sense in ways that no other subs have and there's no way in hell i could put anything more in here the room just will not tolerate it i know some guys that have just ridiculous bass and they brag about oh yeah the the house upstairs is shaking apart and things are flying off tables and shelves i don't like that i don't understand why some people enjoy that and that's like bragging rights that's horrible that sounds like absolute hot garbage to me when other things are making sound muddying the sound that you're supposed to be hearing i just want the pure bass so that's my goal I'll figure it out. I'll get it worked on, but that's a project for another day. So listening tests, the number one thing that I can tell you, unfortunately, there is no way to convey a lot of the experience through YouTube or through any kind of written article or magazine or anything like that. It is something you have to experience firsthand in person. Charts only tell you so much. I can make this chart look exactly the same as some other chart. And it doesn't tell you diddly squat about the difference in sound and experience between two subs. But here's what I'm noticing with these over specifically the SB-16s. As expected and as hoped, there's a lot more physical pressure in the room. I have tripled my amount of sub area. Looking at the area of the circles, the driver diameters, I have tripled what I put in. So I basically went to six SB16s worth of sub pressure in the room, and it made an immediate tangible difference. My seats are shaking just like the bass shakers, except it's not just the ultra low frequencies, it's all of them. Bullets in movies, depending on the movie, Aquaman, for example. You feel them in the seat. You feel them a little bit even in your chest. Hard-hitting kick drums. You feel like you're at the freaking concert. I mean, it's just right into you. And that's exactly what I wanted. Unfortunately, it took this amount to get it in this room. If this was a small enclosed room, I would have had that a long time ago. And for those of you lucky enough to have a dedicated room, you already have been experiencing what I've been missing, <laughs> but now I got it. Uh, songs, and I made a post about this last night. It's like I just got an upgrade to my entire music library because everything with any kind of authoritative bass is just on another level now. It's like another dimension of the bass because it's more physical and it's really enjoyable. So I've been listening to a ton of songs. Uh, there's more bass than I will ever even want. Even turning everything up to max volume, which I don't listen to, the subs are barely breathing. That's all there is to it. I mean, they're 
They're way over maxing the room. They're over maxing my personal taste. So I'm very confident that at least while I'm working on this room, I'm done with subs. There's just nothing else I can do because anything I do that's better subwise will not be realized because of the other limitations. My personal taste and the room shaking and all that kind of good stuff. So great decision in buying the subs. I can definitely say, even though they were five grand, I was able to recoup three of that by selling my old subs. And here's a tip, and this is something I find true with a lot of different things, not just audio. When you resell something, if it's the top of the line in whatever it is, commands a lot more resale value than if it's not. And it doesn't matter if it's bottom of the line or middle of the line. If it's not top of the line, you don't get very much for it percentage-wise. So I try to buy things that are top of the line, not just because I want them, but if it's something I think I'm going to be reselling, I know that's going to command more value later on down the line. And I certainly got that out of the SVS subs. So, you know, basically I paid pennies for them to use them for a year and a half. Bada bing, bada boom. And these subs, likewise, if I go into another house, if I go into a dedicated room and I put in different subs, I know these will command a lot of their resale back. So it's not just pouring money down the drain. Whereas if I would have gotten, well, I, I don't know what would be even considered bottom of the line for PSA subs. I mean, they're all freaking you know industrial subs. But you get the idea. Maybe if they were like 12-inch subs or something, you know, you might get half back. But that's just my advice. Anyway, hope this helps. If you're interested in some awesome subs, definitely check out PSA. Oh, one other quick thing, and this isn't really about the subs per se, but my experience buying them. Really quickly, I talked to a lot of different companies and some even owners and some executives of specific companies, just in general, you know, consumer purchase questions, right? Nothing out of the ordinary. Let me just say that Tom, the owner of PSA, stood head and shoulders above the rest. And this is not knocking the rest because everyone was a consummate professional, but he went so far above the others, just in his general sales attitude. And the one thing that really struck me they were all very helpful, don't get me wrong. Again, this is not knocking anybody. Nobody did anything wrong. But what he did, different from everybody else, is, and this was true of a few, he asked about the room. So I gave video and photos, and he wanted to know what my goal was and you know the, the good questions that you should be asking, right? He asked them, so that was cool, and a couple others did too. But after I told him what I was after, the model I was interested in, he then immediately said, okay, you should also look at this, this, and this, and this from other companies. Didn't say a word, good or bad, about anything. Just knowing what I was after, he knew that these other products from other companies might also fit the bill, might have advantages. So he encouraged me to check those out. And I had already checked at least most of those out. And that just struck me. I mean, it didn't change my mind if I was going to purchase from him or not. But I'm just telling you that that's the kind of sales attitude he has. You know, he, he's out to look for your best interest as far as getting you the right product, whether that's his or apparently somebody else's. So that's it. Thank you very much, Tom. Did a great job not only making the subs, but helping me make up my mind on what I wanted. That's it. See you guys next time.